In this presentation, we will make comments and commentary about Matthew chapter 6 through 7, the last two chapters of what is called the Sermon on the Mount. And so we will finish this sermon that Christ gave to the membership of the church and was directed to those who have been baptized are members of the church, as I said in the last presentation. After Christ has given in chapter 5 the attributes, the behaviors, and the characteristics he wants his fellow saints to develop so that they become like him, in chapter 6, the Savior now turns to our motives. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 24. In Matthew 5, Jesus teaches us what we must do to inherit eternal life. But now, in chapter 6, he turns to the why of what I do. You can have the same outcome, but different motives that produce the outcome. For example, you could keep the commandments out of fear of punishment, out of fear of going to hell, uh, out of just wanting to please my parents, please somebody in the ward, the bishop, or what God, or whatever. And you could have the same outcome. I kept the commandments. But why I do it, will determine whether it changes me and makes me become like the Savior. I could do it out of fear, and I don't become like the Savior. And so in chapter 6, Christ is talking about our motives, why I do what I do. The example of serving others. I could serve others, so, it sh so I'm showing how great I am. Look what I do. It could be all about me, and it's trying to bring attention to me. Or I could quietly go about serving others and not care if I get any credit. The outcome's the same. The person gets served. But whether I change, whether I become like the Savior is very different on my motive. As a gospel teacher in the church for 35 years, I saw this a lot. Commenting in a gospel class. Do I raise my hand in gospel doctrine or somewhere else, priesthood? Do I raise my hand and share something because I want others to think, oh, look how smart I am. Look, I know the answer. Look, I just made a good comment. Or is my only motive, I just want to share light and truth. See, two very different reasons why you would answer something in gospel doctrine. If I just want to share light and truth and the Spirit inspired me to share it, then that helps me become like the Savior. If I'm sharing something because I want to show and impress others with my gospel knowledge that does not help me to become like him and so let's take a look at the different motives christ says we need to have yes you can do the right thing but now you have to do it for the right reason russell m nelson president russell m nelson when he was elder nelson speaking to a graduate of lds business college said this this is a perfect time to set your priorities and make certain that you move in the right direction, he stressed. You do not want to be like the man who climbed the ladder of success only to find that it was leaning against the wrong wall. I may be climbing the ladder of the gospel and doing all the things that are required me, but is the ladder leaning against the right wall? In other words, am I doing it for the right reasons? I must have the right motives. This is what Moroni, chapter 7, verses 8 through 11, what he was trying to point out. Notice it says in verse 8, For behold, if a man being evil give the gift, he does it grudgingly. Wherefore, it is counted unto him the same of his, if he had retained the gift. Wherefore, he is counted evil before God. So if I do something grudgingly, it's as if I had never done it. Now, that doesn't mean that you went, what you went and did doesn't help somebody. Yeah, that's true. But it doesn't help you to become like the Savior. It hasn't changed your natural man any. That's what he's trying to say. You don't become. You're just doing stuff. And so that's why if we do things grudgingly, it's as if I had never done it. Because it doesn't change me to become like him. Verse 9, And likewise also it is counted evil unto man, if he shall pray and not with real intent of heart. And it profiteth him nothing, for God receiveth none such. 
If I pray and seek for revelation, but I have no intent on keeping my covenants or keeping what the revelation is going to be, and the answers, if I have no intention, of real intent of following it and following the Savior, then there's no reason for him to answer that. It, was, it would be as if you had never prayed. I must have real intent. Verse 10 and 11. Wherefore, a man being evil cannot do that which is good, neither will he give a good gift. For behold, a bitter fountain cannot bring forth good water, neither can a good fountain bring forth bitter water. Wherefore, a man being a servant of the devil cannot follow Christ, and if he follow Christ, he cannot be a servant of the devil. If my motive is not to serve Christ, then I cannot become like Christ. An impure motive cannot bring about good results. I must have a pure motive of Jesus Christ. And so with that in mind, the first thing the Savior turns to in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, is doing alms, which means righteous acts of religious devotion. Why do I do religious acts, I'm sorry, righteous acts of religious devotion? Not to be seen of men. If you do it to be seen of men, to say, look at me, look how righteous I am, look I'm following, aren't I great, then you have your reward. It will not help you to become like the Savior, and it will be as if you had never had done them. So what's my motive of why I do what I do? Why do I serve others? What's my motive behind it? In Matthew 6, 5 through 8, he says, what's your motive in prayer? Why do you pray? Not to be seen of men, he counseled. Back then, devout Jews at set times faced Jerusalem, covered their heads, cast their eyes downward, and ostentatiously went through the ritual of prayer. If the hour of prayer found them in the streets, so much the better, for all men would see their devoutness. To attract attention by saying one's own prayers aloud in the synagogue was not uncommon. Such were among the practices of the day. Now, our culture is a little different, but when I pray, what's my motive for praying? If it's not a righteous motive, I do not get a righteous reward. In Matthew 6, 14 through 15, he talks about forgiveness, how we treat others. Complete forgiveness from the heart brings forgiveness of sins. We see from this that in a real sense, we will judge ourselves in hereafter by how we treat others. If I, with a pure motive, forgive others, then God, with a pure motive, will forgive me. Do you see how we will judge ourselves just by how we treat others? We will be treated by the Savior on how we treated others. Matthew 6, 16 through 18, fasting. What's my motive for fasting? Do I quietly go about my fast or do others have to know how hard it is for me because of my comments and facial expressions? See, I could easily just have a disfigured face and just be grumpy. And they say, oh, I'm fasting. It's so hard. I don't like fast Sunday. We complain. Well, if that's your motive to gain attention that way, then you have reward. You got attention. That's all you get. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, he says, What do I treasure? What is the treasures of my heart? Treasures in heaven are the character, perfections, and attributes which men acquire by obedience to law. Thus, those who gain such attributes as godliness, as knowledge, faith, justice, judgment, mercy, and truth, will find that the same attributes restored to them again in mortality. And as it says in Doctrine and Covenants 130, verse 18, whatever principle of intelligence we attain into this life, it will rise with us in the resurrection. Intelligence meaning not so much my knowledge, but my righteous use of truth, my righteous application, so that I come to know what faith, justice, and judgment, and mercy is, because I do those things. I righteously apply them. 
those that that those attitudes and those motives will rise with us in the resurrection. The greatest treasure it is possible to inherit in heaven consists in gaining the continuation of the family unit in the highest heaven of the celestial world. So what is my heart focused on? And that will be my treasure. Matthew 6, 22 through 23, what I pay attention to, what do I focus on? And that will have to do with my eyes. And so that's why the Savior said in Joseph Smith translation, Matthew 6, 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single to the glory of God, if I'm just focused on Christ, my motive is Christ, my motive is I love him, my motive is I want to submit my will to his, my motive is I just want to follow Christ, then the whole body shall be full of light. My eyes determine what I pay attention to, I, what I focus on. Do I focus on the gospel? If we, if, the, if we cease to serve with an eye single to the glory of God, if our spiritual eyes are dimmed by sin, by improper motives, if the light that once was ours turns to darkness, how great is that darkness? Do you see how he's focusing and getting to get our attention that you have to have the right motives? Why are you doing what you do. Matthew 6, 24, the two masters, no man can serve two masters. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, light and darkness cannot dwell together. It cannot be both day and night at the same time. Water cannot be both sweet and salty at the same hour. No man can serve God, who is the author of light and righteousness, while he is in the employ of Lucifer, who is the author of darkness and sin. Mammon is an Aramaic word for riches. You cannot serve God and love riches and worldliness at the same time. See, those are two very different motives. Loving God with all my heart, my mind, and strength, and just wanting to submit my will to His. Or, I love riches. I love the things of the world. I want the things of the world. Matthew 6, 25 through 34, the Savior we learn from the Book of Mormon, when this same sermon is given in 3 Nephi, we learn that these verses were counsel and instruction for specifically the 12 apostles. Now we can learn from the principles that are in them, but the words he turned to the apostles and directed these words to them. Notice what it says in 3 Nephi 13 through 25. After giving what we have just talked about, the motives, it says, And now it came to pass, when Jesus had spoken these words, he looked upon the twelve whom he had chosen and said unto them, Okay, remember the words which I have spoken. For behold, ye are they whom I have chosen to minister unto this people. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than remnant. The twelve different from us have a specific calling to be involved in servants of God full time. They are to not concern themselves at how they're going to make a living, where things are going to come from. God will take care of that they are to full time. Their focus is only on Christ. Okay, that's a little different than us. We don't have that calling. They do. And so that's why he's now addressing to them this counsel. The Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 6, 30 through 38, tells us that apostles were to give full-time service. Therefore, they were to set aside and as secondary the things of the world. So now Joseph Smith's translation of Matthew 6, 30-38 says, Wherefore, take no thought for these things, but keep my commandments wherewith I have commanded you. I want you to full-time focus on ministering and in the church, not on keeping a job, having to do those things. I'll take care of you another way. The church takes care of them in that instance, in their material needs. Verse 31 
For which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? 32. And why take ye thought for remnant? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. 33. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 34. Therefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he not provide for you, if you are not of little faith? 35. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewith shall we be clothed? 36. Why is it that ye murmur among yourselves, saying, We cannot obey thy word, because ye have not all these things, and seek to excuse yourselves, saying that, after all these things do the Gentiles seek. 37. Behold, I say unto you that your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. And then 38. Wherefore, seek not the things of this world, but seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All of that was counsel directed to the quorum of the twelve, because they were to give full-time ministerial service. They were not to now go out and make a living. They were to rely upon God to provide for the material things as they first sought to build up the kingdom of God. You can imagine back then how much faith that would take, as I'm sure today amongst that quorum. It takes faith that we as church members will help with our offerings and tithing, help support them materially so they can focus 100% of their time on the kingdom of God and upon Jesus Christ. Now the principle for us is the same. We too should seek first to build up the kingdom of God, not build up our name, not build up our kingdom, not build up material wealth or success. But we should also seek to build up the kingdom of God and then God will help take care of us, even though a lot of our time will have to be spent in accumulating material things to take care of ourselves and our family. But the twelve had a different calling. Now let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. This whole chapter is about judging. Right judging and wrongful judging. And he's Tell him, beware, make sure you judge correctly. And there are different various types and different settings that he now brings up. So one, I want you to develop the right attributes, chapter 5 of Matthew. Two, you've got to have the right motives. And now three, in Matthew 7, make sure you judge things correctly. Because Saint will try to get you to judge wrong. And that will be to your detriment. So beginning in Joseph Smith's translation of Matthew 7, 1 through 3, he tells us this. Now these are the words which Jesus taught his disciples that they should say unto the people. Judge not unrighteously that ye be not judged, but judge righteous judgment. For with what judgment ye shall judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. You see how it's different than the King James Verse 2 is added that's not in King James. You can't say we should not judge. You have to judge. You have to judge. You have to get up in the morning and judge what you're going to put on, whether you're going to get up, whether you're going to put on clothes, what you're going to do, what you're going to watch, what kind of entertainment you're going to look. We have to judge every day. So judge not that you be not judged was very incomplete. No, make sure you do not judge unrighteously. Make sure you use righteous judgment. Well, what is righteous judgment? We learn from the Book of Mormon, Moroni 7, verses 14 through 18. He teaches us, Wherefore, take heed, my beloved brethren, that you do not judge that which is evil to be of God, or that which is good and of God to be of the devil. See, Saint will try to get you to do that. The good look evil and evil look good. Make sure you don't do that. Don't judge what God has said is good and that that's evil. That's what the world does. And that's what the Pharisees and scribes were doing. They were judging Christ. And they said, <clears throat> he cast, <clears throat> excuse me, he did miracles because he was the prince of Beelzebub. And he casted out devils because he was the prince of devils. 
See, that was just totally wrong judging. Verse 15 from Moroni 7. For behold, my brethren, it is given unto you to judge. We are to judge. You just must do it correctly. Because how you judge, that is how you'll be judged by Christ. That ye may know good from evil. We are meant to judge the difference between good and evil. And the way to judge is plain. That ye may know what the perfect knowledge as the daylight is from the dark night. Verse 16, for behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man that he may know good from evil. Wherefore, I say unto you the way to judge. For everything which inviteth to do good and to persuade to believe in Christ is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore, you may know with the perfect knowledge it is of God. That's how I cannot be deceived. If somebody or something is trying to persuade me to do something that is not good, that does not invite me to come unto Christ, then that is not of God. And I have a right to judge that and turn it down. There are certain behaviors that people may do or try to get me to do that are not compatible with Jesus Christ and his laws. I have a right to judge those behaviors and say, no, I will not do that. And I have a right to say, no, I will not associate with those who are tempting me to take me off the covenant path. That is righteous judgment, to judge people unrighteous behavior so that I don't lose my exaltation. He's saying, I give unto you to judge. That's what it says in verse 15. Verse 17, But whatsoever thing persuadest men to do evil and believe not in Christ and deny him and serve not God, then you may know with the perfect knowledge it is of the devil. Don't do it. Don't follow it. So any behaviors, any attitudes, any situations that cause you not to believe in Christ, not to keep his laws, not to serve him, then you have a right to judge that and say, no, I'm not going to associate with that, those behaviors, or those kinds of people. If that will affect me and get me off the covenant path, that is righteous judgment. Continuing verse 17, for after this manner doth the devil work. For he persuadeth no man to do good, no, not one, neither do his angels, neither do they who subject themselves unto him. Did you catch that? The devil cannot cause you to do good. He never will. And he will use others to persuade you to do evil. You have a right not to associate with those who are trying to persuade you to do evil. That is righteous judgment. Verse 18. And now, my brethren... Seeing that you know the light by which you may judge, which is the light of Christ, see that you do not judge wrongfully. For with that same judgment, ye shall, which ye judge, shall all, ye shall also be judged. Make sure you judge the things of God as the things of God and follow his covenant path. Make sure you understand what those are. Those things that persuadeth and enticeth us to do good, to follow Christ, and to come unto his Father. Judge those. Pick the right things and follow them. Now, what is unrighteous judgment? The Savior now turns to that in Joseph Smith's translation of Matthew 7, verses 4 through 8. We're very familiar with this. Now he's going to tell you, now here's, here's the kind of judgment you do not judge. Here is where you do not have a right to judge. Verse 4, and again, ye shall say unto them, Why is it that thou beholdest the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? So pointing out everybody's faults and their imperfections, We do not have a right to do that when we have our own. In other words, I do not have a right to condemn another person. Knock that off. Stop that. I can judge behaviors and whether I want to participate in them. But I do not have the right to make assumptions and condemn another individual. Or, if I do that kind of judging, 
then Christ will condemn me. By what judgment you judge, I will judge you. Continuing, Or what wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mold as thine eye, and can ask to behold the beam that is in thine own eye? Here, let me tell you all the things you're doing wrong, Why the whole time I have a list of my own. Verse 6, And Jesus said unto his disciples, Beholdest thou the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests and the Levites? They teach in their synagogues, but they do not observe the law, nor the commandments, and all have gone out of the way, and are under sin. But yet they're trying to pull out the motes out of everybody's eyes, when they don't even follow the commandments. They're trying to judge who's righteous and who's not. I don't have a right to do that. Behaviors, attitudes, yep. I can judge those and whether they will take me off the covenant path and not associate with those behaviors. But to condemn someone, that is unrighteous judgment. Verse 7, Go thou and say unto them, Why teach ye men the law and the commandments when ye yourselves are the children of corruption? Say unto them, ye hypocrites, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. You cannot condemn someone until you have gotten rid of every sin in your own life. And see, that's none of us. Only Christ has the right to do that. Because he has no beam or moat in his eye. So true. I may judge behaviors and decide not to associate with that. But that doesn't mean I have to condemn those people. That is very different. I can still love my neighbor as myself without associating with sinful behaviors. And so unrighteous judgment is when we make assumptions about others and we condemn them based on those assumptions. That is unrighteous judgment. That, he tells us, knock it off. Joseph Smith, Matthew 7 Chapter 7, verses 10 through 11, he now talks about judging and keeping sacred things sacred. Make sure you judge when to share certain sacred things with people. Judge carefully. There are certain spiritual experiences and sacred things I've given you that you do not probably share with anyone. Certainly you would not share with those who would mock them. That's what he's talking about when he says, And the mysteries of the kingdom you shall keep within yourselves, for it is not meet to give that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls unto swine, lest they trample them under their feet. Do not share sacred teachings or sacred experiences with those who will mock them and treat them like swine would treat them. Don't do that. Be better judges. For the world cannot receive that which ye yourselves are not able to bear. Wherefore ye shall not give your pearls unto them, lest they turn again and rend you. They may take the sacred experiences you had and use them against you to mock you and to condemn you. Keep sacred things within yourselves, brothers and sisters. Brother Elder Bruce R. McConkie writes, Faith. Repentance and baptism are the mysteries to the unbelieving Gentiles. But the mysteries of the kingdom of which Jesus here speaks are quite another thing. This phrase has a special meaning. It refers to the deep and hidden things of the gospel, to the calculus, as it were, which can only be comprehended after the student has become proficient in arithmetic, algebra, and geometry. It refers to the temple ordinances, to the gifts of the Spirit, to those things which cannot be known only by the power of the Holy Ghost. You do not just go and share the temple ordinances with just anybody. They are too sacred. They would mock them. They would not understand them. Gifts of the Spirit and the spiritual experiences we have, we keep them sacred and within our heart. Joseph Smith translation of Matthew now 7 verses 12 through 20. Make sure you judge and know the truth which will only come by revelation. 
Learn how to judge and get revelation, because that's the only way truth will come. It says, starting with verse 12, Say unto them, Ask of God, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall not find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Verse 13, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and unto him that knocketh it shall be opened. 14. And then said he unto then said his disciples unto him, Well, they will say unto us, We ourselves are righteous, and need not any man should teach us. God, we know, heard Moses and some of the prophets, but us he will not hear. In other words, his disciples turned him and said, The Gentiles and the non members, they will say, Well, there is no more revelation. He has spoken, God has spoken, and Moses has talked to us. And other prophets, they got revelation, but God does not speak to us. He will not hear us. God does not give modern revelation today. Boy, be careful. That is a wrong judgment. Verse 15, and they will say, we have the law for our salvation. That is sufficient for us. We believe the law of Moses will save us. We don't need a Messiah. We don't need a Savior. We have the law of Moses. Do you see how they're judging wrong? Because they do not know how to get revelation. Divine truth only comes by revelation. And so they're making bad judgments about what brings salvation and what is true. Verse 16, Then Jesus answered and said to his disciples, Thus shall you say unto them, What man among you having a son, and he shall be standing out, and say, shall say, Father, open thy house, and I may come in and sup with thee will not say, come in, my son, for my is thine, and thine is mine. Any father would say that. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give good things unto them that ask him? See, the Pharisees and the scribes would not go to God in prayer and ask if this was the Messiah, if this was the truth, if the church was being restored in their day, and that Christ was doing it. They didn't have faith in the Father. Therefore, they didn't get divine revelation. They made a bad judgment. They made a judgment that revelation had stopped. And all there was was what Moses and the other prophets had given. And it was turning to their condemnation. We must not be guilty of that. Truth comes by revelation. Do we trust Father that if we go to him with real intent, with pure motives that he will guide and direct us in truth. Now, Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20, judging those who claim to be God's leaders on earth. See, I have a right to judge that. If someone claims to be a prophet of God, I have a right to judge whether that claim is true or whether it is false. In fact, if I don't judge that correctly, it will affect my salvation and my covenant path. And so how did he say you can judge that? By their produce, meaning their fruits. By what they produce, their fruits, you can judge the claims to divine leadership. As Elder Bruce Armory Conkey writes, A true prophet is one who has the testimony of Jesus, one who knows by personal revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and that he was to be or has been crucified for the sins of the world, one to whom God speaks and who recognizes the still small voice of the Spirit. A true prophet is one who holds the holy priesthood, who is a legal administrator, who has power and authority from God to represent him on earth. A true prophet is a teacher of righteousness to whom the truths of the gospel have been revealed and who presents them to his fellow men so that they can become heirs of salvation in the highest heaven. A true prophet is a witness, a living witness, one who knows and one who testifies. Such a one, if need be, foretells the future and reveals to men what the Lord reveals to him. A false prophet is the opposite of all of this. Anytime anybody makes the claim to be a prophet of God, I have the right and duty to judge whether that is a true claim or a false claim. And the only way I can do that is I have to get revelation myself from the Holy Ghost.
and the way I proceed is I see what they produce. What are the fruits of what they claim? What are their motives? What are they producing? And do they produce the fruits of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what a true prophet is supposed to produce? That's why you can take Joseph Smith and see what he produced. The Book of Mormon, the Temple Ordinances, the priesthood, and the explanation of the priesthood and all the different offices, the gifts of the Spirit, the gift of prophecy. He produced the fruits of a true prophet. And then as you put faith in that, then you go and ask God, is this true? And you can receive a witness that, yes, Joseph was and is one of God's true prophets. And all of those since him are also. Well, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, this is now talking to members of the church. This is a famous scripture, Lord, Lord, uh, not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, etc., etc. This is he's talking about members of the church. That there will be many who say, didn't we cast out, then we do miracles and cast out devils, and then Christ will say, I don't, I don't even know who you are. Well, who's he referring to? Well, he's talking about members who did not endure to the end. Brother Elder Bruce R. McConkie writes, For the day soon cometh that men shall come before me to be judged, to be judged according to their works. I am the judge. I am the Messiah. Look unto me and live. I shall sit in judgment upon the world. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy day, name done many wonderful works? To whom is he speaking? Is it not to those who have been baptized, those who have gained the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, those who have received the holy priesthood and have cast out devils and worked miracles? Two answers of equivalent meaning are recorded to his question. Both are answers that will be given to those saints who have not endured to the end. Yes, for a time, they did good works. They did many things but they did not endure to the end. Back to his quote, who have not kept the commandments and who have not pressed forward with a steadfastness in Christ after baptism. In one, the account says, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. In the other account, the words are, and then will I say, ye never knew me. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you and you never knew me. Your discipleship was limited. Your heart was not so centered in me as to cause you to endure to the end. And so for a time and a season, you were faithful. You even worked miracles in my name. But in the end, it shall be as though I never knew you. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? If ye believe that I am he of whom the prophets testified, if you accept me as the promised Messiah, if I am the Son of God and ye call me Lord, then keep my commandments, endure to the end, worship the Father in my name, and ye shall be saved. That is the key. We may for a season do many wonderful things in the name of Christ. But then if I get off the covenant path and I stop and I do not endure to the end, then it will be as if we had never done them. It will be as if we never knew the Savior and he never knew us. The key is to stay on the covenant path till the end, to submit willfully and wholly unto Christ. And to do that all the days of our lives. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.